So it's my great pleasure to welcome our opening keynote orator who will speak on distribution for sustainable health care. Dr David Pension is the director of the NHS Sustainable Development Unit which aims to make the NHS a leading sustainable and low carbon healthcare service. He was previously director of the Public Health Observatory in Cambridge from 2001 to 2007. He has worked as a clinical doctor in the NHS, a joint director of public health, a public health training program director in the east of England with the NHS R&D program and in China in the early 1990s with the Save the Children Fund. This is a modestly brief introduction, but I'm sure that we will all um, enjoy and benefit from his uh, oration on distribution for sustainable healthcare. Thank you very much indeed, Madam President. So, welcome to Congress and thank you for inviting me. And uh, I will try and continue the proud tradition of Harry Burns about how we as doctors can change and improve the world. I sort of want to start by acknowledging um, the welcome I've had since I've been in this part of the world. I'm hosted by the Planetary Health Platform and Wiser Healthcare at the University of Sydney. Um, but I've, I've been immensely impressed by all the hospitality from not just this Royal College, but its faculties, from the president of the Faculty of Public Health Medicine, Lynn Madden, who you will see chair a session following, just following this. Um, so thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm honored. You're always, um, those of you who've spoken in other countries will know that you always receive a much more courteous welcome when you're in a foreign land. I can assure you from what I will present to you that you don't receive such a courteous reception necessarily in your own land. So what I really thought I would do is um, talk about my story, or not just my story, but the story of what we've tried to do in the, in the NHS in the UK. And many of you all have worked in the NHS in the UK. Um, but I'll tell you the story of how we have thought that health systems and health professionals can sit up, stand up, speak up about some of the more important things going on around us, not just the important things going on in our clinics and our surgeries. And I'm going to do it by telling you some stories of how we've managed to disrupt the health service for good, I hope, in both senses of the word good, um, and using a particular lens. Now, my view is that if you, took, if you were a Martian and you looked down on the Earth you, and, and its history, you would be perplexed by three things. You would sort of be perplexed by um, climate change. That would be very odd. You would be perplexed by the amount in which we go to war with each other, by how much conflict there is, bearing in mind that we're essentially a collaborative species, but we play well to our competitive instincts. Um, and the third thing I think we'd be interested, we'd be fascinated, we'd, we'd be baffled by if we were Martians looking down, would be the degree of disparity in health, wealth, and life chances you see around the globe. Now, many of you have just switched off your mobile phones. Now, you can pick up any mobile phone in the world and phone any other. So a Martian might think we lived in a global village, but when they looked in the disparity in life chances, alongside the potential we have to do something about it at scale and at pace, they would be baffled. Now, with all of those three areas, I'm not going to talk about all of them in any length, except, the, the, except climate change, which is I'll try and stay, stay in my area of competence or semi-competence. Um, but they are all connected, and I think you'll hear throughout this whole Congress that we do need to think broadly, we do need to think in a very connected way, we do need to think in a very systems thinking way. So I'm just gonna tell a few stories over the next few minutes uh, before, as a warm up for the Red Fern oration by Professor Woodward. Um, so I'll start with what is not a very cheery slide for a Monday morning in Sydney. And this is a mass grave, uh, unmarked grave, sadly, in a hot place. And 
I would ask you to consider where you think this is in the world. Um, there are just 42 mass graves here, unmarked, unknown. It's in a hot place. You have thoughts going through your head about where it might be. So I'll tell you that it's in Chicago. This is Chicago in 1995, and you might have judged by the, the slide there that this is a heat wave. This is a heat, and now Chicago gets heat waves all the time, but this heat wave killed a lot of people. Now, Australia is used to heat waves, uh, and hopefully it doesn't kill as many people here, but there was something very significant in Dr. Yellen's address, and that is looking at the signal amongst the noise. And I want to return to her phrase of how we need to be more than just clinicians in our operating theatres and our surgeries and our consulting rooms about looking for the signal in the noise and speaking up about it. These are the uh, meat wagons that the hospitals had to hire, nine meat wagons, because the number of bodies was so great. Now, why did this happen? Why did this heat wave kill so many people? It killed so many people because the system, the system messed up. The civic officials who should have been on top of this were 200 miles north in their holiday homes. Okay, this is a system failure. It's just exacerbated by climate change, which is happening now here on this planet across the whole thing. So this, to echo the president's comment, is the signal amongst the noise. And of course, we only see whatever that biological or geological variable is in the dark blue lines. That's what we see every day. If I talk in the UK about a two degree rise in the global temperatures, most people would say, that sounds rather nice. <laughs> so we have to be very careful about how we frame climate change and specifically what we as physicians, as doctors, as health professionals have the opportunity to do, which is not frame it as an environmental issue, but I would really, really urge you to frame it as a health issue with yourself, with your family, with your colleagues, with your policymakers, with your politicians. And eventually, it's going to come around to discussing it with the public and the patients. Um, but you may know that actually air quality, a very important issue on which we'll present some data about how many people it's killing prematurely and unnecessarily in the cities of this world, has been in many places, in all pla of all places in the United States, rather successfully addressed. And one of the reasons for that is because air quality in the United States is framed as a health issue, not as an environmental issue. So please don't distance these things that are happening now to us, to our families, to our patients, by just calling them environmental issues. So that's certainly one of the important lessons that I think we've learned in how we as physicians frame, how we as physicians disrupt the cool, calm, collected thinking that we would like to aspire to, but in fact, sometimes we, as we say, need to sit up, stand up, and speak up. So I've just added a threshold line to that slide, that horizontal line. And if you look to the top left carefully, you'll see that one of the variables exceeds that. Now, that is an extreme weather event, okay? And we, we, uh, we can deal with extreme weather events. In fact, we as doctors love extreme things. I went to medical school because I love drama. I love crisis. I love being a technocrat. I love blue lights. Now, so we love crises. We're crisis junkies. And that is not a great thing to be. We need to be much better than that. We need to be able to have the foresight to see that without action from trusted members of the community, we're sleepwalking into a nightmare. And I suspect throughout this Congress, you'll hear really good data you'll hear really good data, evidence, about what is happening. But we have to disrupt ourselves and break out of our sense of what strategic thinking is. When I was a clinician, my idea of planning was to reach the end of the clinic. My idea of strategic planning was to reach the end of the weekend on take. 
So I think we are creatures, we as physicians, we as doctors, exemplify short-termism in human thinking. But we are better than that. We're bigger than that. There's a bigger prize to be won by us, to be able to stand up and say, there's something going on here which is a health issue, which is affecting health of every country, every person, every community in the globe, some much more quickly than others. So that extreme event you see there in the top left, just follow your, take your eyes across and you see how those extreme events are changing rapidly in frequency, severity, and duration. And severe weather events kill. And you'll hear a lot more about these events in this Congress. So we have the ridiculous situation now in the UK where the news headlines say, this is the third one in a hundred year event this decade. Now, I might have been trained in a little bit of statistics and epidemiology, but even I know that's not going to hold water for very long. So, and this creeps up on us. And it does need people to be able to look into the future and say, we are frogs in a boiling, a warming pan. So that it's very, very important that we frame this as a health issue. Okay, we're not, we're not people who love crisis and get over them and then think, phew, bring on the next one. We need some much more important thinking. So these are slow, mo slow motion emergencies. These are emergencies exactly like an ambulance outside ER, except on a longer time scale, increasing frequency, severity, and duration. And that's why Fiona Godley, who's editor in chief of the British Medical Journal, at, at sometimes great risk to her personal reputation, talks about climate change as in the same way as The Lancet does, as one of the hugely important health issues of our time on our watch now happening. And uh, what's very interesting is that how much we as doctors sometimes kick back against these editors who put the evidence up, who do the research, who alert us to our roles. And it makes me think in my darkest days that we as doctors are not on the front foot about this. And I'd like to show you that we as doctors and physicians and health professionals and medical scientists absolutely need to be on the front foot because the history of the world has shown very clearly again and again there's nothing more dangerous than good people doing too little. When good people do too little, bad things happen. Okay? So I think one of the important objectives of this Congress is to equip us is to empower us, is to inform us, is to skill us to be better advocates for those things fundamentally that help us and our patients and our public lead lives worth living. And I use that phrase, lead lives worth living, very, very purposefully because that is one of the best definitions of health I've ever come across. So we all like to call ourselves health professionals here. And... Uh, Funnily enough, when I was at medical school, I don't think I ever went to a lecture called These Are the Causes of Health. I went to plenty of lectures about These Are the Causes of Multifocal Loop Encephalopathy, but none about the causes of health. So if we want to live up to the name we happily append to our role and our title, we might want to have due diligence and due concern and due understanding of those things that help us help others lead lives that are worth living. Extremely important. So, but when we do this, when we go to lectures on health and climate change, and you'll hear some terrific ones in the next couple of days, you'll hear things like, well, it causes cataracts in Indian women in the fields because higher rates of ultraviolet radiation. That is indeed true. You'll hear about dengue fever and malaria, and you'll hear about melanoma, uh, a condition this country is very familiar with. But these are diseases that are in our parrot, that's this is our language. We are disease specialists. This, so we're comfortable with this. Where we get uncomfortable as physicians is when we move on to things like bushfires, heat waves, um, flooding. Now these have significant mortality and morbidity, crop failure, economic collapse, migration, civil disorder, and ultimately what we've seen already. So what we've seen in Easter Island is a perfect, perfect example of what we're seeing on the globe. So we're, we're all living our lives on an Easter island. 
But unfortunately, we're surrounded, for instance, here in this beautiful city, by comfort, by civility. We're immunized from the effects. We're completely immunized from the effects of what we do. We as individuals have no idea what the effect of our behavior is on all those things which are going to make life possible and worthwhile and better in the future. So I would urge you to, of course, stick to the day job of looking at the diseases that we see on the left-hand side of the screen there. But I think we ought to do more than just politely observe what's going on on the right-hand side. We ought to speak up. Doctors are dangerously trusted, you know. People actually believe what we say, so we might as well use that um, for public good now and in the future. So one of the journeys I've been on the last 10 years is to try and do all I can for policy and practice in one country uh, about making health and care services meet the needs of the present, which I hope we all do, but at the same time being very cognizant of the fact we have a duty to people in the future who have less choice and voice, as we do, as Harry Burns would say, or indeed people elsewhere in the world. This is not just about the future. This is not just about looking in a different time. This is about looking at a different place and how much of the wealth and comfort and security that we enjoy, we enjoy, about half the population of the world enjoys, is at the expense of somebody else. And whether we do this knowingly, because if we do this knowingly, that's where the most important part of the di disruptive mechanism comes in, in terms of disrupting our own thoughts. Much as we'd love you to have a wonderful time at this Congress, we do want you to go away different, changed, disrupted, motivated, agitated, concerned. And I hope we can do that, and we can help each other as physicians do that in ways that are constructive and diplomatic and effective. Now, that's a big ask for all of us here. So I won't dwell on this, but this is the broadly the picture that if you haven't seen in your personal professional careers, you'll see a lot more of. And it, all it simply does is to show the red of what happens if we don't sit up and stand up and speak up, or the blue if we do. It's, it's that simple. It's, and as that, this is today's job. It's not for next week or next month or next year. It's today's job. How we live our day is how we live our life. Now, this isn't a guesstimate. This isn't a, these bars here are confidence intervals, okay? The strength of the evidence that this is happening now on our watch is better than the evidence of most clinical interventions. Okay? So if you're happy with the clinical interventions that we prescribe day by day, you need to be happy with this. You need to be comfortable with this. Okay? So having, having been exposed to that, if you're exposed to that for the first time, and four degrees, six degrees is not a place you want your children to live in. It's not a place you'd want to live in either. Um, much as it sounds warmer if you'd come from a country like the UK. So I would maintain that we've had a proud tradition of 200 years of health professionals, physicians, taking disruptive political action. Everything from slavery, cholera, smoking, nuclear proliferation, alcohol, obesity, HIV. Actually, we do step up to the mark, but it seems to me odd that notwithstanding a few very concerned physicians, doctors, health professionals in all countries in the world, including this one, including Australia and New Zealand. Actually, I think per capita, I will try and demonstrate to you, per capita, there are more physicians and health professionals in Australia and New Zealand who have investigated the science, who've mastered the advocacy, who understand the need to sit up and stand up than in any other country in the world which is supremely ironic when you talk to people, and, and I've talked to plenty of people since I've been in Australia, in Canberra, politicians, secretaries, physicians. It seems particularly ironic with so much good science and so much good advocacy that you have that you're not world leaders. You should be world leaders. That's what you should be as a country, as a profession. You should be world leaders in this. And you are in certain areas, but the, uh, the dots are not joined up. 
So this is a, these are about scientific and technical issues, but they're all about, also about communication issues. A colleague of mine who's a very well-respected um, journalist for the Guardian newspaper, um, he phoned me up a few years ago, having come back from a climate change conference, and he said to me, David, I just learned the most extraordinary thing about climate change, which really surprised me because he, he's a very smart cookie. Um, I said, and what's that? He said, well, I knew that, I knew that climate change was an environmental issue. I write about it in the newspaper every day, and those of you who read The Guardian will know that The Guardian does do its fair share of reporting on this. Um, but he said, I knew it was an environmental issue, but no one told me it was a health issue. Does that not strike you as weird? That is weird. It's weird for me, but it just shows me, shows me how narrow-minded I am, how constrained my thoughts are, how much I assume that people think like I do. And that's one of the, one of the real perils of being a citizen or being a doctor is believing that people think like you do. <laughs> because it's a huge barrier to empathy with your colleagues, with your family, with your kids, with your patients. So this is the... Um, so I urged him to write about it, and he did. He wrote about it the next day. So climate change isn't just about the environment. It's a health issue. So please start framing, if you haven't already done so, these concerns about climate change, about international development, about poverty, about human conflict, as health issues. It makes a big difference because you're speaking with the badge you wear. You're speaking with the mandate you've been conferred upon you. You've been speaking, you'll be speaking with the skills that you've got. And that will make you listened to and respected and more effective. Why? Because in every survey ever done, doctors and nurses will always come out at the top. We are dangerously respected. Spooky, it's spooky, it's scary that people believe what we say. So get the facts right, but also get the framing right. And uh, so it's, you know, this has been used over and over again in history. This is an advertisement. Those of you young people in the audience won't remember this sort of stuff. But, you know, the world has changed a lot. And, and colleges of physicians did a huge amount on tobacco. So if you think tobacco is a thorny, insidious, commercially driven addiction, then try climate change, because it's logarithmically bigger. But the skills that we as physicians used to counteract a, a determinant that kills more people now in the world than it's ever killed, N not in Sydney, not in Australia, not in Cambridge, not in London, but in China, Southeast Asia, more people now die of tobacco-related diseases than have ever died on our watch, on our planet, okay? So one of the other lessons of large-scale change is that don't think the progress is always forward. You might, be, you might curse yourself it's slow, but you'll curse yourself when it goes backwards. And we've seen in some political elections over the past few years that things can go badly backwards. Don't think progress is always forwards. So as I said, the journals are good on this. We're good. The New England, the Lancet, the BNJ, and uh, the MJA, and huge credit to the MJA for devoting a recent issue entirely to this. So if you haven't read this, then I would put that on your to-do list. I would recommend it. In fact, it was so in, so in demand for downloads, they had to make it open access for a week. So... Planetary health is part of our core business because the health of our patients is at risk. That is the core message. So I won't go too much into the science of what's causing it, but what I do want to do is do what we often don't do in these issues, is look at solutions. So I want to spend the rest of the time I've got talking to you about stories, about solutions. Okay? You have to be positive. You have to be solution-focused. Okay? Martin Luther King did not say, I have a nightmare. Okay, you have to focus on solutions. So what we did 10 years ago is we did something very, 
uh, we did something which I thought was going to be very difficult. It actually wasn't as difficult as I thought it was, which was to measure the entire environmental carbon footprint of the health service in, in England. Okay? And we did this with colleagues at the Swedish Environmental Institute. We just went to the best methodologists. You, if you're going to tread on disruptive soil, get the best methodologists you can. Okay? Because you will have to defend yourself and your actions, your spending of public money in front of the harshest critics, politically and commercially. So don't worry too much about that. All that shows is that we've measured it along the top, we've reduced it somewhat, and we need to be down where you are in the bottom line, okay, in the bottom right-hand corner. Okay? So that's a, roughly about an 80% reduction on, 20, uh, on 1990 levels. That's the law in the UK. It's the law in the UK. And it's the law in certain parts of Australia as well, just in case uh, you didn't know. Um, so that, ladies and gentlemen, is not efficiency. That is not making our health service a little bit more efficient. That is not having a few bike racks outside the front. That's not having a few LED bulbs in the front. This is about transforming the way we do health and healthcare, okay? And we are not immune from this. Not only we're we not immune from this, but we have every opportunity to lead. We have every opportunity to demonstrate this is possible. And I just want to quickly tell you some stories to show you how. When we broke that up, it was about three quarters procurement, okay? And it'll be the same in your house, in your family. Three quarters of what you buy contributes to your footprint, okay? And of that, the largest single fraction is pharmaceuticals, okay? Pharmaceuticals has a huge footprint. And what are we really good at doing with pharmaceuticals in the health and care system? What do we do eye-wateringly well with pharmaceuticals in the health system? We waste them. We waste them. Now, pharmaceuticals are fantastic things. I don't think I'd be here if it weren't for pharmaceuticals, and many of you wouldn't be too. But we waste them. So if you want to do some research where you probably get the biggest citation index because you'll be cited endlessly, is calculate of the world stock of pharmaceuticals that we make on this globe, what percentage ends up having a positive therapeutic value at an individual level with acceptable side effects? We can put that on the app as a question at the end of the day. And I have to tell you that we don't know the answer to that, but it's an important question. It's a really important, because it wastes money, it wastes opportunity, it changes the sex of frogs. It's just a bad thing to do. And no business model in the world, in the commercial, would tolerate that sort of supply chain. So what's the carbon footprint of Australian healthcare? Well, if you remember, back to the earlier slide, the, the carbon footprint of the, uh, the UK, uh, the, the English health service, is 35 million tonnes. That doesn't mean anything to anybody. It's a big number. It's exactly the same in Australia. It's exactly the same in Australia. The carbon footprint of the Australian healthcare system is exactly the same as the carbon footprint of the English health. We have a lot more people. Um, so something's happening somewhere. So we need to get to the bottom of this. It's very big. The carbon footprint of the Australian healthcare service is the same as the carbon footprint of the whole of South Australia. It's big. And we do some great things. And some of this carbon is absolutely worth making because we do good things, but that's big. Okay? And this is based on very good science, and the, the science, if you're interested in going to it, largely stems from the IPCC, uh, which is the largest group of scientists ever in the history of the planet that's ever agreed on anything. Okay, uh, the evidence is good. So you have to, um, you have to trust me. I used to be a doctor. Okay, so what we did in the UK was make sure that we, as health professionals, spoke out. And when the IPCC evidence was published, what we did was we got the 60 leading physicians and medical scientists to publish in numerous newspapers that this was a health issue. Never before we said, have we known so much and done so little, okay? And that gave us a huge mandate to act in the health service. Now, there are other ways we got the mandate in the health service. Two mandates, the science and the law, okay? So that was very important for us. So this is the law we had in the UK in 2008 introduced by Tony Blair. 
And that is the law in the state of Victoria in Australia. It's almost identical. So put your hand up, those of you in, from Victoria who knew you had a climate change act. Oh, that's impressive. That's good. Well, could I recommend you use it? Because the law is a great mandate in a quasi-democratic society. It's very effective. There's nothing more effective than someone, when someone says to you, why should I do this, to say, it's the law. I mean, you can choose to ignore the law if you like, but survival is not compulsory. Okay. Survival is not compulsory. So there are a number of levers, and much as you only Australians would like to think you're an edgy, challenging, disruptive country, you're not. You're extremely well behaved. You're extremely polite. You're extremely civilized. I went cycling around Sydney a couple of weeks ago, and there were many, many shared pedestrian and cycleways. I never saw one pedestrian walking in a cycleway. I just thought, this is a ridiculously well-behaved country. That would never happen in London. So lots of room, lots of room for disruption. And other states indeed do have policy frameworks as well. So don't, don't let your lack of political leadership stop you from being disruptive, okay? I don't think politi the nature of political leadership is good politicians don't lead, good politicians follow, okay? And who do they follow? They follow the most trusted people in society. They, tr they follow people that voters respect. They follow people like you and me, okay? Tony Blair once said, I am their leader, I must follow them. Mm. And it's true. Good politicians rarely have original ideas, but good politicians can be fantastically good leaders. Uh, sorry, good, good listeners. So I would urge you to do that. I would urge you to use your collective voice. So what was the result of the activities in the NHS? Well, we managed to reduce in 10 years the footprint by 11%. And the legal limit for that 10-year period was 10%. So we exceeded the legal limit. We reduced it by 11%. At the same time, we increased activity by nearly a fifth. Okay? So I just put that there. I did, do, I did none of this. I, it happened on my watch. Whether it happened anything that I did is another issue completely. Um, but it's possible. It's possible. It has been done. Health services are so big, you'll always catch someone doing something right somewhere. Okay? All you need to do is industrialize it and norm it. Okay? And in the same time, in the first year we did this, we saved 17 million pounds. After four years, we saved 353 million pounds. And after 10 years, we'd saved 1.8 billion pounds doing this. So this is a good story. This is a good story where you address the issues of health, environmental protection, and economic viability. So no one, any, if you go in to, and say to a, a politician or a manager, I'd like to help you save some money, that is, that's not a bad way to start your conversation. You happen to do it through actions that will also address climate change and health as well, but start where, people, start where people's values are. And some people's values, weirdly, are with money. I know not for us noble citizens in this room, but for others it is. So I just want to, want, I want to just sort of finish off by a few little stories about global disruption in the causes of planetary health, about powering, caring, feeding, moving, buying, selling, building. Okay, so let's tell some stories. So here's the future. The thing is about the future is already happening. That's the great thing about the future. If you look, it'll be fair. This is just concentrated solar power. It's a very easy renewable technology. Uh, it brings a lot of health and wealth and jobs. Um, we know, we know that in Europe, we can power the whole of Europe by renewables from North Africa. Okay, we know that. It's simple. It'll cost a few trillion pounds. That's all it will cost. It is not much money, I assure you. There's plenty of money swilling around the global economy. It's just swilling around in the wrong place. So if you look at those four red squares... The second one down is the, is the area of the desert we have to cover in, in the Sahara to power the population of Europe with clean, cheap, reliable, secure, healthy, green electricity by 2050. 
That's good. Now, let me ask you a question. What will happen when you move such a huge resource from that yellow part of the map to the greener part of the map? Do you move a massive resource one way, and what is going to move the other way? The answer is money. The answer is resource. The answer is tech. The answer is development. So here you have an example of how you can meet the first of the wealthy world and at the same time redistribute resources in a grossly unequal world. That is a good news story. If you want to know more about it, there's a very compelling model called contraction of, and convergence where we help address the twin scourges of climate change and international poverty. And that is one way of doing it. So what is interesting about that is that in North Africa, you can then desalinate the seawater, you can grow crops, you have shade, you create jobs, you manufacture food, you address poverty, you address inequalities. This is good news. This is very good. If You can do this around the world, actually. So if you look at all countries where renewable energy is cheap and secure, you see that there are certain countries, many of them quite poor. So it's a very compelling model with a, a so-called supergrid like the internet that just distributes electricity. But there's one country on that map. There's one country on that map. <laughs> that if I were a Martian, where would I choose to live in the future? I would choose to live in a country that was well-educated, had good weather, and a lot of desert, not too many people. So does anybody know the area of the bush you need to cover with photovoltaics to power Australia in 2050 with clean, cheap, secure electricity? It, yeah, very good. Yeah, it's about 40 by 40 K, 40 by 40 kilometers. Now, could you spare 40 kilometers by 40 kilometers? OK. So that's where you choose to live in a technical sense. Would you choose to live there in a political sense? Well, I would be, it would be rash of me to make any suggestions completely. So here's where the world, this is the world that produces the greenhouse gases. This is where greenhouse gases are produced. This is a cartograph. This is a cartograph that shows the, the per head, per capita carbon emissions. Now, it's historically based, actually. So this is done historically, which is why the UK, I'm not being an apologist for UK, but we started this. Mia culpa. We started this in the UK with the Industrial Revolution. Um, but I'm going to show you, this is from the Lancet 2009 Commission. I'm going to show you another cartograph now to show you where the WHO climate mortality statistics are similarly portrayed on a map. Okay, are you ready? Look carefully. There. Okay. Anyway, that's wrong. So we need to do something about it. And we can do something about it. So this is uh, Eric Chivian. Some of you may know Eric Chivian. Uh, I want to show you this is not all about carbon reduction. It's largely about carbon reduction. But I want to show you that there's an even richer world out there to explore. This is Eric Chivian, who is a doctor from North America, very wise gentleman, a psychiatrist, works in Harvard. Um, he won a Nobel Peace Prize for forming an organization called the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, where he got 50,000 doctors around the world to sign a petition and lobbied for the instigation of what were called the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks between the Soviet president and the US president, which resulted in some quite significant medium-range missiles, I think, being abolished. Not all of them, but it made significant progress, okay? Almost entirely through the voice of the medical profession. Um, and Eric Chivian was in the UK a couple of years ago, and he was saying that, actually, you know what? That was quite easy compared to climate change. That was a very specific thing they were trying to do. And he told this wonderful story, which, if you want to know the full story, is in the BMJ a couple of years ago. So that Eric wrote, we persuaded him to write it up as an essay in the BMJ. And he told a story about this little critter here that some of you in this audience will know. This is a cone snail. A cone snail is a very small snail that uh, kills its prey by releasing toxic peptides, small, do you remember 
polypeptides, small chains of amino acids. Okay, even I can remember that. The, um, but each one produces about 200, and there are about 200 species of this, and they're all different, these toxic peptides. So there are tens of thousands of toxic peptides in these range of cone snails. And we have analyzed precisely 0.1% of them. We've already found a drug which we call zaconitide, which is a 1,000 times more powerful than morphine and completely non-addictive. That is good news. That is what the pharmaceutical sector have been spending squillions trying to do. Okay, it's in a cone snail. There's another molecule that's um, very good at treating refractory temporal lobe epilepsy, which some of you will know can be difficult to treat. Um, so this is great. Uh, that's the good news. And I think some of you know what the bad news is. I think some of you know where this cone snail lives. This cone snail lives on the coral reef. And in 10 years, it will be gone. So we are knowingly sacrificing the future. I'm sure we'll save it somehow. But I want you to know that there are things going on on the planet which we should be standing up and speaking up about and acting on. So I want to tell you, take you from those global stories to some local stories to finish off. So this is a hospital. Some of you may have worked in it. It's in Nottingham in England. It's the Queen's Medical Centre. It was once the largest hospital in Europe. Now, I had a friend who there called John. And John is not a physician. He is an assistant catering manager. Now, he's a leader. He's a leader. As are all of us in the room today, we are leaders. So get used to it. Um, so John came into this job as assistant catering manager. He went into the foyer of the hospital and he saw Kentucky Fried Chicken, Burger King, and Starbucks. And he said, this does not look like a health organization to me. So he politely asked them to go by breaking their contract. And the patients were really hacked off about it because the patients love coming down to the foyer of hospitals. And I can understand that, having done it myself. Um, so he put in his own coffee shop, very good coffee, and he let the, all the others back in and just kept undercutting them in price. And he turned his attention to the food served on the wards. The food in this hospital used to be made in another country. Another country. And shipped overnight in huge trucks, triple rats, to be put in microwaves to be slopped up appetizingly in front of patients. This is a health organization. So John broke the contract stopped the trucks coming, went out to local farmers and said, would you like to supply your local hospital with food? And local farmers said, hey, hey, steady on. Whoa, 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 whoa. We've never broken into this big commercial racket of multinationals. And he said, I will help you do this legally. And he did. He, he got all the dairy and all the meat and all the fruit and all the veg from local farmers within about 15 kilometers of the hospital. What that meant was that patients had to eat seasonal food. And people said, oh, this will be completely unacceptable. Patients won't like eating seasonal food. And here's a really interesting lesson. Don't ever let people tell you what other people will like until you've asked them, OK? So we asked the patients, and the patient said, this is lovely. It's great. It's fantastic. Thank you. And the food became so good that he served it in the canteen for the physicians and health staff. And then the public started creeping into the refectory. And people said, but the public are coming to our refectory. He said, that's great. Let's make the canteen in the hospital a community asset. Let's make this hospital open to the public a bit more in showing how we can cook good food. That's good. And it started, uh, then he realized he had to um, get more people to cook the food. So we got people off the unemployment rank. He got people who were unemployed to train them to cook food. So he monitored how much he reduced the unemployment rate. Okay? This is a hospital adding social value to their community. And then he won a huge contract for Meals on Wheels and Social Services to supply all the Meals on Wheels in Nottinghamshire with local food. And he monitors it. And do you know how much this cost? Nothing. It was cost neutral. And he keeps two million pounds a year in the local economy. So politicians like it. And when, his, when the leaders of the hospital, the chief exec of the hospital, you know, who was sort of quietly allowing this to happen, 
All the other directors and non-execs said, this is wonderful. So John allowed them to go in front of the cameras to go on press to show what wonderful leadership the hospital had. Not John. Not John. Okay? So this is a good news story. So the bad news is that it's difficult to do this in every hospital, but you have to do it. So he was awarded a, the most prestigious um, award for Food for Life, which is good. And you can do these things. Um, and this is what Liam Donaldson said. I'm moving to physical activity now. Move more. Okay. So this is the wonder drug, physical activity. Good for your mental health, good for your physical health, good for carbon reduction, good for social cohesion. So Jarrett and Woodcock and Andy Haynes at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine published in 2012 how much money the NHS could save, money the NHS could save by instituting an active travel scenario just within the NHS, addressing a diabetes which had risen 60% in 10 years. Diabetes type 2 consumes 8% of the total healthcare budget in the UK. Okay? It is largely preventable and sometimes reversible. We should not be seeing these things happen. So you do have to frame the argument well, though. You do have to engage people. So it's one thing knowing the science. It's another knowing how to get it into. So you end up with this ridiculous situation. This is not a physical activity strategy. This is not taken from Australia or the UK. It's taken from our English-speaking friends over the Pacific. Um, so what we did in the UK was, first of all, we did, we, we've had a massive part of our strategy is about mobilizing healthcare staff, lift share, decreasing car park sizes, introducing free parking for low carbon vehicles, but most of all, getting hospitals to report on it. Actually, the most effective thing is to go to the chief exec and say, can we paint out the sign that says chief exec parking only in the car park? Because that creates, a, that really disrupts things. So, but it does mean you can have a bit of fun while you do it. And the other thing is you can address air quality. Air quality is a much more politically engaging issue than climate change. So we calculated the emissions in terms of NOx and PM 2.5 and PM 10 of every hospital in the country and let them know about it and let them know how many preventable emissions they as a hospital were responsible for. So that was quite important. So I'll come on to the third one now, which is buying. So I want to introduce you to Abu. Abu is, 11, is, um, is, is a young kid. He works, he's seven years old. He works in Silakot. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Silakot in northern Pakistan. Put up your hands if you've ever heard of this area. Yeah. This is a really important area of the world where half the surgical instruments in the world start their lives. Okay? Half the surgical instruments start, and half of those are in well-regulated factories, but the other half are in appalling conditions. And Abu works in appalling conditions. And so he's unlikely to get to adolescence without a little piece of metal flying in his eye or losing a finger. Um, and he earns 25 pounds a, a month, okay? So, a colleague of mine from the UK, ENT surgeon actually, he was there, um, this is my friend Mahmoud, and his cousin said, oh, you're a doctor, let me show you what's happening in the next village. And he took Mahmoud round, and Mahmoud was absolutely and understandably and rightly shocked by this. So Mahmoud has started a program, and this is very low glamorous activity, looking at ethical supply chains in the world's supply of medical devices through the world, okay? And he started an organization with, these, with the support of his Royal, the Royal College of General Practitioners, actually, and the BMA about supply chains throughout the world. So when we unwrap things and uh, use them, and sometimes use them only once, we need to have an eye for the effect of our supply chains. So many of you will be very happy to drink fair trade coffee. And I wonder whether we should be happier to be using fair trade medical instruments. But these can be done, and this is, this is expanding. So I'll move on to energy quickly. This is a, a hospital in Northern Ireland, in Antrim, who get, uh, they make 60,000 pounds a year from generating electricity by putting up a turbine that paid for itself in two years. It's been operating for 12. That's gonna save you money. 
save you a lot of money and improve health as well. We can do this. This is a hospital in North Staffordshire. Now, you know how sunny it is in England. And so we, we, we never waste an opportunity to use cells on the top of buildings, public sector buildings. And I'm, I'm sure you do the same in Australia. Every piece of roof not covered in cells is money going down the drain. Okay? The reason politicians got interested in renewable energy in the UK is because citizens were doing it themselves and bucking the energy market. So the hospital here actually could not afford the capital to put these cells on. So they did a community share issue and they raised a third of a million pounds from members of staff and from the community and there's no capital cost to the NHS and a third of a million pounds a year goes into local fuel poverty programs. Why? Because the NICE guidance says that this is what we should be doing. So we have embedded some of this practice into regulations, and that's incredibly important to do that. Could you do the same in Australia? Well, the cost of wind and solar is cheaper than coal in Australia. For new build, it's cheaper. And the cost, the solar cost in terms of the Australian dollars per megawatt hour generated is falling dramatically. So it doesn't even be, need to become a health issue, it's just become an economic issue. So start as an environmental issue, move on to the health issue, and then capture those people who are still cynical by using the economic issue, okay? So finally, I just wanted to finish by showing you how we build the future. So this is a hospital. Can you see the hospital there? It's a big hospital, okay? It's a children's hospital, actually. So it, it was completely uh, unfit for the future. So a new hospital was built. And if you look there, there's the new hospital, okay? Much, much smaller. We don't need bigger hospitals. We don't need more hospital beds. We need smarter hospitals. Okay, and this is what happened to the old hospital. Okay, that's how to build a hospital. A hospital as a center of a health system. The center coordinating a health system, not delivering it all, okay? Only do in hospitals what hospitals can do best. Now, this may be the most disruptive message to you here today, who spent much of your life in hospitals, and I'm sure you'll love working in hospitals. But we're gonna have very different hospitals of the future, because if we don't have different hospitals of the future, we're not gonna be doing our patients the best we possibly can. We're not going to be using the public purse in the best way we possibly can. And we're not going to be able to be exemplar citizens and professionals in a, a, in a future which we want to see created. Finally, finally, how do you really get this at scale? So this is the Royal College of Physicians and their definition of quality and quality improvement, which I'm sure you've done similar work on, and the six criteria of quality of healthcare embeds everything we talked about this morning. We changed the mantra of the NHS in England from high quality care for all to high quality care for all now and for future generations. You absolutely have to hardwire the future you wish to see. You may think this is a cute phrase, but it, what it does is it empowers people who are doing this under the radar anyway to suddenly say, my goodness, it's part of my day job. I don't have to apologize for doing this. This is part of our day job. So don't underestimate the power of changing regulatory instruments, changing mission statements, very important. Do you have a framework in Australia? You do have a framework in Australia with all these august organizations signed up to it. It's a well worked out plan. There's nothing more practical than a plan do you have guidance for what, hospitals can, for what hospital doctors can do? Yes, you do. Generate it here in this country. So it's there, and we can give you the references, you can have the links, you can look at the slides. So, don't get obsessed about climate deniers. Climate deniers are an irritating distraction. They're very powerful. We know that in 
in the tobacco world, there are still very dark forces trying to undermine all the work that people have done over generations to get rid of tobacco, and they're even stronger. But it's not the deniers that should worry you. It's those people like us who are disavowers, who know it's a problem and are doing too little and too little together. That's the important. It is hardwired into international agreements. It's hardwired into COP21, the right to health, and to exploiting the co-benefits, which I hope we've been showing each other well this morning. It's hardwired into sustainable development goals. We do not need more worthy reports from global organizations telling us what to do. The, the baton is in our hands. We can do this. As I said, we've had 200 years of health professionals doing this. And I think we should step up to the mark and make sustainable development and climate change one of the big missions which you and I can proudly lie on our deathbeds and say, I did more than I could have done, not I did less than I could have done. There are some wonderful, wonderful people in Australia, and I'm sure we'll hear in a minute in the Red Federation some of the profound science that we've built on science from Australia that's allowed us to do in the health system with health professionals in UK what we've done. And this is one of them. Um, so I would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, we have a choice here. We could put our head in the sand or we could draw a line in the sand. But I really want to finish by just bringing to your attention the fact that there are a huge number of people in Australia and New Zealand who've working, who are working very hard on this. Nearly all of them clinicians, in my view, and I've been working with them for nigh on 10 years. So you have nothing to lose but the future, but you have to do a little bit of disruption. And the way that in place that disruption starts is in your own head. You're not gonna do this unless you do what the president of the college urged us to do and that's completely reassess what is it, the legacy that we wish to leave on it, these issues of our time, like climate change, like human conflict, and like international health inequalities. We can do a lot, but we cannot do it alone. You must, not hunt, you must hunt in packs, okay? One person is a crank, two people is a pressure group, three people is public opinion, okay? Numbers matter. Numbers with good voice, good framing, and good scientific evidence will change the world. That's exactly what the late Jonathan Mann from WHO said. You know, if you want to change the world, you need good data and good framing, okay? And I hope that some of the examples and principles that we've used in the UK, and some of which we've actually learned from colleagues here in Australia, can help you in doing your jobs to deliver health care and promote health. Thank you. Thank you.